And I am excited to start uh, stepping more into this series. So this series has been uh, an interesting one. As a matter of fact, uh, I was up kind of late last night trying to navigate today's message. Let me explain. So the topic of this particular series is, I have a question. And the basis of that is, is it's okay to ask God questions. It's when our attitude turns into questioning God. And that's what we want to work on. That's where we want to have a better understanding of our relationship with God. And that is that you really can ask him questions. You really can ask him, why this? Why that? This is happening. What's the point? I don't understand something in the scriptures. God, reveal it to me. And I know that there are religions in this world that you're not allowed to ask your God questions. It has this effect like, you know, you don't have faith, you're questioning, uh, you, you don't trust. Not our God. Our God is the living God, and he is in relationship with us, and he wants you to come to him with your questions. Amen? He wants to know what's going on, and he wants that relationship with you. And that's what this series has been about. And as we get into today's particular message, we're going to talk about a man named Joseph. Now... I've been around and around. It was seriously probably 11 p.m. last night before I finally said, okay, this is the way I'm going to do this. Because the life of Joseph is a fantastic story. It's got everything. It's got promises and betrayal. It's got unseen, you know, moves and promises of God. It's an incredible story. But as I was going through it and I had these points that I was pulling out of his story that match today's uh, context, but if you don't know the story of Joseph, you're not going to get the most out of today's message. So I've de- made a decision, and I even had to ask my wife to help me. Uh, we are actually going to go through the story of Joseph. All right? So just hang with me. So we're going to make our way through the story of Joseph, and we're going to extract points that we need for our life in the context of this series. All right? So we're going to get there. We're going to get through this, but I'm just going to need you to really tie in. It's a heavy biblical uh, story, so at the biblical literacy levels, hopefully we'll go up. And so we're going to walk through this, but don't check out because it's a fantastic story. So who is Joseph? All right, so last week we talked about Jacob. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, right? And if you didn't see last week's message, I cannot encourage you more. Go to the YouTube, watch last week's message, go to our Facebook, look up last week's message. You really need that in your life. So go back and watch that. But this week, we're going to continue on about this story of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons is Joseph, okay? And as it turned out, Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And his brothers were aware of it, and his brothers hated him for it. And there was a moment that was, where we see this activation of Joseph's life, and it's because his dad, Jacob, gave him this really special article of clothing. It's called a, it was a multicolored tunic. Some people call it a coat, but to be more precise, it was a multicolored tunic, all right? And a tunic is different because it goes down to like your palms, and it goes down to your feet. It's really long, and it's multicolored. And he gave him this gift, this article of clothing, and it just was an expression of, this is my favorite, basically, because no one else got that gift, and his brothers hated that he got that gift. But they also didn't like it, and this is just my extraction from this, is this particular coat didn't make any sense. This tunic was not of Hebrew culture. So as Joseph is walking around wearing this thing, people are like, who do you think you are? Like, what is that? What is this supposed to be? Like, it was an, it was an anomaly in their dress code of culture. It was strange. And so he had given him this coat. And then after he had given him this article of clothing, Joseph has two dreams. These dreams are critical And we need to look at them and we need to understand them. So I've asked Pastor Elizabeth if she would actually help us this morning 
uh, and she is going to read a little section of this. And these are the uh, one of the two dreams of Joseph. So she's going to read this, but I really want you to listen to the description of this dream. It's Genesis chapter 37. It's verses 6, 7, and 8. Pastor Elizabeth, would you read that, please? So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Okay, so he has a dream. He ends up having a second dream that shows similar thing where his mom and dad are bound down to him. And even his dad saying, you telling me that me and your mom are going to bow down to you? I mean, the audacity, right? Like, I can't believe that you would say that. But his dad says, kept that in his heart. So this is the same thing we saw with Mary when she heard from Gabriel the angel about her son, Jesus, and she pondered it in her heart. Remember that from Christmas? We talked about that. We see the same thing where Jacob is confused, but he's saying, I'm going to keep that because maybe that's significant. Okay, so Joseph has these dreams. He tells his brothers, and now they really hate him. They just absolutely hate this guy, and they decide we need to get rid of him. Uh, they even considered killing him, but they said, let's not kill him. So they take him, and they rip the tunic off, and they throw him in a pit. Then they start to feel bad, so then they go back, and they pull him out of the pit, and they sell him to traders that are on their way to Egypt. And these traders take him, and these tradesmen go down to Egypt, and then they sell him to a man named Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard for the pharaoh of Egypt. So now he's a slave in this guy's house. Now back up in Canaan, the brothers went and told their dad Jacob, uh, Joseph's dead. You know, he's, he's dead. Look at the tunic. It's all ripped and bloody. An animal must have killed him. And his dad is sad, and he just accepts the fact that his son is dead when in fact his son is completely alive and he's a slave in Egypt. Now, what happens after this is really starts to get interesting because when he goes down there and he's in this house and he's a slave, we start to see something take place that gives us insight to our life. So Pastor Elizabeth, would you read Genesis chapter 39 verses 2, 3, and 5? The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So Joseph's blooming. He's a slave. But now that he's a slave in this house, it doesn't seem to matter. God is with him. And the, pot, the owner of the house, his slave owner, Potiphar, he recognizes this and he says, I want to put you over everything that I have. And everything starts to be blessed. There's an old saying, rising tides raise all boats. And Joseph is like a rising tide. He walks in and everything just starts to be blessed and favor is everywhere. I want to make this point to you. God hasn't left you, though it may feel like he has. Joseph has got to be feeling, what on earth have I done wrong? I did nothing. My dad gave me that coat. I didn't ask for that tunic. God gave me those dreams. I just shared them innocently. I didn't mean to, to insult anybody. And they throw me in a pit. They sell me to traitors. I'm now a prisoner in this house. And now Potiphar is getting all of this blessing. And I'm sitting here. That's not what Joseph said. Joseph decides he's going to bloom wherever he's planted. And the blessing of God is with him. And that's an encouragement to Joseph because he's looking at this and he's saying... Well, God hasn't left me. 
I wouldn't choose to be here. I don't want to be here. This isn't my choice of life. This is not the design of my life. God has put me here. And clearly, the favor of God has come with me. Now, after that, the story goes on and it gets worse. Potiphar's wife, she kind of falls for young Joseph and she's attracted to him. So she pursues him relationally, but Joseph says no, he denies her. And this goes on for a while and he just keeps up the good front and he says, no, I'm not gonna do that. But she gets frustrated and she decides that she's gonna lie and tell her husband that Joseph has assaulted her and he believes Joseph. So then Joseph is snatched up and he's thrown into a jail. Now he's not thrown into just any jail. He is thrown into the jail of the Pharaoh, which means that the only prisoners that go into this jail are people connected to Pharaoh and Pharaoh's house. So this is a special jail, all right? So Pharaoh got this jail and Potiphar throws Joseph in there. He's still innocent, being treated like he's guilty. And I wanna look at what happens because this is critical. So Pastor Elizabeth, please read Genesis 39, verses 21 through 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. And he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Now you know this, when I say God is good all the time, this is Joseph's story. Now he's in a jail for something he didn't do and he gets there and the favor of the Lord is with him and everything around him gets blessed and the jailer gives him all of this authority like he's running the show and there's Joseph again stuck in this really bad situation. And everywhere he goes, bad things happen, but not of his own hand. This is the ground and soil for a bitter life. This is where our attitudes could kick in and we just become a bitter person. Life's unfair, this isn't what I wanted, I haven't done anything wrong, everybody's against me, everybody just hates me, God, where are you? This is, I'm done. That's what typically happens, could have happened in the pit, didn't happen. Could have happened with the traitors when he was, in, when he was kidnapped, didn't happen. Could have happened when he was sold to Potiphar, didn't happen. Now he's in the jail and it's still a good attitude blooming where he's planted. He's seeing the favor of God and he's realizing God's still with me somehow, some way. He's not left my side. Even when we don't understand, we can trust God, amen? amen. Now, here we go. He's in jail and the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, takes his baker and his cupbearer and he throws them in jail. And we're not completely sure why, but we do know that the Pharaoh had a birthday coming up, so I'm guessing the baker must have screwed up a cake or something. And he throws, seriously, and he throws them in jail. Um, I guess when you're Pharaoh, you can kind of do that kind of thing. Um, I know uh, for my birthday, uh, I am very thankful for everything that happens to me. And uh, even the cake is always perfect. And I'm very thankful for all that you do. Um, my birthday's a ways off, but I'm just trying to get those points in there, babe. The Pharaoh throws these two men into jail, the baker and the cupbearer. And they're of course put under Joseph's care because he's running the show. And Joseph's looking after these guys and each of these men has a dream. And they're really frustrated because they had these dreams and they don't have anybody to interpret them. So they, they're sad and Joseph's watching them and he goes to them and he says, hey, I can interpret your dream for you. They say, okay, these are the dreams. So Joseph looks at the baker and he says, your dream means that you're gonna die in three days and birds are gonna eat your flesh. Now, I'm just gonna say this right now. Not so politically correct, not so kind in this day and age, who would be confident enough to look at somebody and say, yeah, you're dead. You're not gonna, you know, we would be like, you know what? 
the next three days could be the best days of your life. You live them to the fullness. He's like, no, birds are going to eat your flesh. On to the next dream, you know. And then the cupbearer tells him the dream, and he says to the cupbearer, you are going to be restored in three days. You're going to be back serving the Pharaoh as his cupbearer again. And wouldn't you know it, both dreams happen, and Joseph was correct. So Joseph tells the cupbearer, not the baker, because who's going to listen to him, but he says to the cupbearer, when you go back, Tell Pharaoh who I am. And he kind of tells him a story. He's like, I don't, I don't belong here. This is unfair. I shouldn't be here. He's like, can you tell him and I can get out of here? Cupbearer says, yes. Does the cupbearer do it? No. Never says anything, probably because he's afraid to even bring up the fact that he was in jail and he's vouching for criminals. He's probably like, I'm back. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just going to go to work. So two years go by. Two years go by, Joseph is stuck in that jail. And then something happens. The Pharaoh has two dreams. The first dream and the second dream need to be interpreted. He doesn't have anybody to interpret them. And the cupbearer says, ah, I can get some favor by telling the Pharaoh, hey, there's this guy in jail and he can interpret your dreams for you. So they get Joseph, they pull him out, they set him with the Pharaoh, and he interprets the Pharaoh's dreams. He says, dream number one indicates seven years of abundance. You're going to have a great seven years. The second dream is seven years of extreme famine, and everything you saved is actually going to be needed to survive the second seven years. And he looks at Pharaoh and he says, what you need to do is save, and you need to prepare. And you need to find somebody that can do that for you. Yeah, Joseph's kind of throwing his resume in there. And the Pharaoh says, yes, Pastor Elizabeth, will you read for us the Pharaoh's response, which is in Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 through 43. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. <laughs> the day has come. The dreams that he interpreted are last week's story. Jacob's up in Canaan. He's with his sons. A famine hits. And they're like, we're going to have to leave. The whole time they're going through that, Joseph is down here working to the right hand of the Pharaoh and everybody thinks he's dead. Okay, so think about last week's message. This is the connector. Joseph is now in a position to save his family's life. Not just his family, but the promise of God to Abraham and to us. He is in this position, and it has been stressful. It has been unfair. It has been the kind of a situation that probably every person that I know, including myself, would have given up on by now. Certainly, God is not real. Certainly, my mistakes are bigger. Certainly, I have made a mistake somewhere, but not Joseph. Joseph has stayed, and he has trusted the Lord, and now he is at the right hand of of the Pharaoh. Now, let's flash forward. Through the first seven years, we're into the second two years of the famine. Okay? Joseph's been leading this thing the whole time. Jacob up in Canaan hears that Egypt has food. He says, hey guys, he says to his sons, I want you to go down to Egypt. I want you to ask them if they'll give us some food. We're starving to death. So they go down to Egypt to ask for food, but of course, they don't get to talk to Pharaoh. They got to talk to the man in charge. So what they don't realize is they're about to walk in and meet who they thought was their dead brother. Now, there's a lot to this section of the story. 
I'm going to skip over that part, and I'm going to get to the moment where he reveals himself to his brothers. Because as they approached him, they had bowed down to him, fulfilling the prophecy of those dreams. It's happening. It's all making sense now. Joseph is receiving his brothers. His brothers are realizing it. They're bowing down. This is a mind blower. Total meltdown. I cannot believe this is happening. What a moment for his brothers. What I want to look at is Joseph's response to his brothers. Genesis chapter 45, 5, 7, and 8. Pastor Elizabeth, would you read that? But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph gets it. He, I mean, he had a chance right here. And he gets it. He understands his place in the story of God and man. And he says to his brothers, you didn't do this. God did this. And we're all going to live because of it. Now, flashback, all right? Let's go all the way back to a 17-year-old Joseph. His dad loves him. My mom and dad love my oldest brother more than me. I understand some of their pain. It's okay. I love you, mom and dad. They're not watching. His dad gives him this tunic. Now, I, for years, this tunic bothered me. It bothered me. Because it's like in the story, and even for our kids downstairs, they'll, they'll do like the little coloring books, and it'll be Joseph in the multicolored robe, and they'll draw it in, and there's Joseph. And it's, but it doesn't have anything to do with the story. It's like, yeah, he liked him so much, he gave him a weird coat, you know, like, what is that? The dreams are pretty fantastic enough. Why does this coat need to be in there? What's this tunic? It's bothered me for years. I'm going to tell you my take on the tunic. This is a hot take from me to you. Okay. The tunic was not of Hebrew culture. They didn't wear that, those clothes. That's not how they dressed. They would not dress in a tunic that went down to their palms and went down to their feet. They certainly wouldn't wear a multicolored one, and he certainly would not wear it because they were herdsmen. So remember back in the story, before they really had it with their brother, it says they saw him coming through the fields. The dad had sent him to the fields. So here comes Joseph walking through the fields, mud, you know, animals and all that comes with that, and he's wearing his tunic. This glowing, colorful tunic that looks like a woman's robe, sounds like a woman's veil, and here he comes, and his brothers are like, I can't stand this guy. Look at that. That's it. We're done. I'm killing him, someone says. And they're like, you're not going to kill anybody. He's dead. What is the deal with this tunic? So I was in Egypt. I had wondered about this tunic. So I had some Egyptian uh, historians and Egyptologists in my, in my ministry. And so I sat and talked with them. Hebrews did not wear multicolored tunics. But you know who did? Egyptian royalty. His dad didn't even realize at the time that he was giving him a prophetic gift. He was wearing his prophecy. He was wearing his future. 
His brothers hated that thing. That's why in the scripture, when they threw him in the pit, it says they ripped it off his body first. The last thing his brothers did was rip that tunic off of his body. And the next time they saw him, he was probably wearing one. God will clothe you in your purpose. And you don't let anybody rip it off your body. After this, he has these dreams. These dreams, are they're just the end. That's how we ruin movies and books for people, you know? We just tell them the end, you know? It's like, well, forget it. But God gives them these dreams, and it's just the end of the dream. It's, it's just the, the, the cool part for Joseph and the offensive part for his family. You're going you're gonna to stand all tall, and we're going to bow to you. You're younger than us. What makes you so special? You're letting that tuna go to your head. You know what wasn't in the dream? Hatred, betrayal, pit, a kidnapping, a lie, a sale, a slavery, an accusation, and a jail. But all of it was necessary for the dream to come true. I want you to scan your life right now. Worship team, if you would come. I want you to scan your life right now. And if I handed out a piece of paper and a pen to every person in this room, even little ones that could write, we could all make a list of unfair. We could all make a list of wrongs. We could all make a list of things that we don't understand that are happening to us or have happened to us. But we serve the potter who takes the raw material, the raw material of your circumstances, the raw material of your brokenness, the raw material of your sadness, the raw material of the unfairness in your life. He takes that raw material and he works it and he gives it a new name. He makes it art makes it right and he makes it purposeful he makes it necessary and then the process you look back and you're like yeah the whole time he was with me the whole time he was there Joseph's life God takes the pain and he gives it a new name. And I know life is hard. But when we put that difficulty in the hands of the great potter, he molds it into something beautiful. But you have to trust. You can ask questions. He wants you to talk to him about it. He wants to know what you think. You just can't quit we keep moving on and the story keeps unfolding and the more you look back the more you realize I wouldn't be here if I wasn't there first how could I have known that so years ago years ago reading this story I asked God man God you, you did a work with Joseph I was a younger guy pretty hopeful about the future had a really tough past at times all was starting to make sense but then I asked God I said God you took a Hebrew whose family, his brothers hated him all the way through this process and you took him all the way up to the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation the world has ever seen. 
My question, God, is why not just make him Pharaoh? Why stop at two? You could have done one. You could have made him the Pharaoh. You could have made him the top. He's, he even told his brothers, it's, like, it's like, I'm a, like I'm the father to Pharaoh, but he wasn't. That's my question, God, why did you stop at two? I want you to think back to last week's message. If Joseph was Pharaoh, they would have never come to Egypt. He just would have sent food up. Stay home. I got you. I'll just barge it up. You want to see Egypt, though? Just come down. You can come in and out. You can have a vacation home down here. You can have anything you want. You can stay in Goshen. You could go down to the Valley of the King. You could go and live anywhere. I'm Pharaoh. But that wasn't what God needed him to do. God needed them to leave Canaan because he needed to prepare it the right way for their future. If he was Pharaoh, there wouldn't have been any slavery. And remember what the scripture said, because they were oppressed, because that they were treated poorly, supernatural growth took place. They never would have been past just a family. They went from 70 to 600,000 men because of the slavery. They never would have learned how to be master builders, master architects, master farmers, organized in every kind of array, understanding battle, understanding philosophy, being able to build religious temples. They wouldn't have learned any of that because they wouldn't have needed to if Joseph was Pharaoh. We gotta stop questioning God and trust him. I know life is hard. But you gotta trust God. 